How many of you have ever heard the term kiss? I, now, that's interesting as I say that because some of you are like, oh, you're talking like what you know, happens at a wedding at the end of it, you know, and you may kiss your bride, right? Um, some of you are like, oh, yeah, that's a band I really used to like to listen to, and then I got saved. Um, you know, um, others of you know what I'm talking about. It's just keep it simple, silly. Or some people keep it si simple, stupid, right? Um, but the idea of keeping things simple. One of the things that happens within Christianity, within the faith, is a lot of times we complicate things that were never meant to be complicated. It's sort of like, say, uh, with evangelism, how do you share your faith with someone? I've had people say, how, how do you share your faith, Tim? How do you go about, like, I, I, I hear you say, hey, I was talking to so-and-so and accepted Christ and I want to get, they want to get baptized. How do you get to that point? And people think I'm like trying to pull a fast one on them when I say, I just ask. I just ask questions like, hey, have you ever accepted Christ? Hey, have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ? And I either get a yes or a no or a go away, right? Um, questions like, hey, have you ever been baptized? I either get a yes or a no or what is that? I just ask. It's that simple and it gives me the opportunity to share. Within uh, pastoral circles, theological circles, over the last few decades, there's been something that has been overly complicated, and it's discipleship. Discipleship. Many times I will sit in groups of pastors for a luncheon, maybe go to a pastor's retreat, and I can guarantee almost every single time the question is going to come up, how do you do discipleship at your church? And, and um, people don't believe my answer when I, when I say it. I'm like, well, we preach and teach the Bible. And they're like, okay, but like what curriculum do you use? And, and do you have a seminar? Do you have classes on this? Do you have? And they're asking, looking for all of these methods on how we disciple people. A disciple is a person who has put their faith in Christ and is now learning to walk the Christian walk, to be a Christian. But check this out. 2,000 years ago, when the church was started, what curriculum did they have? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. That's all they had. They had the Old Testament that was the inspired word of God written down by prophets and by the Holy Spirit. They had preachers, teachers. They had apostles, evangelists, prophets. They had these people that were gifted to take those words and teach people what they meant. Pretty incredible. Pretty incredible. As the early church moved on, the Holy Spirit inspired again the apostles and the evangelists to write, and we got the New Testament. So today, we're going to look at the last part of Luke chapter 9. We're going to finish out this chapter. And when we look at this, I'll just, you know, cards on the table. This is um, a section that's a little bit difficult to do in a normal preaching pattern, the way that we preach today. And the reason why is the last part of this chapter is five different really small sections. Five different sections. And they all seem like they're divided and separate. It's sort of like when you read Proverbs. If you've read Proverbs, you go from proverb to proverb to proverb. And a lot of times it's like, wow, that was one fortune cookie. Here's another fortune cookie. Here's another fortune cookie, right? Um, just these little wise sayings, but they're all grouped together. Sometimes if you pull back, you can just know the reason why these seem so uh, separated and yet they're put together is because in Proverbs, it's all about becoming wise. With what we look at today, these five little sections, it's all about being a disciple. It's all about being a disciple. Now, over the last like seven chapters, what we have experienced is Luke writing down what has taken place over three years of Jesus' ministry. As we finish up, 
chapter 9, we're getting to the end of Jesus' first three years of ministry, and the rest of the Gospel of Luke is going to be focusing on the last six months of Jesus' ministry. If you were here at the very beginning of this series when we started Luke, I mentioned that Luke isn't completely chronological. It's not. And the section we're in right now is not chronological. If you go to Matthew and Mark, these teachings happen different times. It's Luke just covering the bases with these different teachings at the end of chapter 9. And when we get to chapter 10, now what is happening? It's not Jesus just up around Galilee anymore. Now he's going to be traveling south, up in elevation though, so it'll keep saying he goes up, towards Jerusalem. And from 10 on, his focus is on the cross. So that's what we get to in this. We're going to pick it up at Luke chapter 9, verse 43. I'm going to do my best to take these different sections in such a way where they make sense for us and we understand it's all about us learning to walk with Christ. Luke 9, 43, this is what we read. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them, so that they might not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this same. As I went through the section with these five little pieces here, in my own notes, I just put little words to them of what I I, I kind of summarized each section on. And this first section is part of discipleship. This is about clarity. This is about clarity. Jesus has a shift that's taking place, like I said. He's been up around the Sea of Galilee, ministering in the wilderness, ministering in the different towns there. He's gone at different holidays down to Jerusalem, but then straight back up into Galilee. He's done a little bit of ministry in Samaria as he's traveled back and forth from the temple to the Sea of Galilee, but primarily up north. And as we read and get to this section... He is trying to make his mission and his goal clear to his disciples. And it's kind of amazing when you look at it. I mean, you look at the words, and they seem straightforward. Let these words sink into your ears. Pretty clear forward. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. Now, for us, we sort of have read the end of the story right? We know what's taking place. For them, it was confusion. It was confusion. The Son of Man, what does that mean? I mean, Son of Man, that's a reference back to to the book of Daniel, when Daniel sees the Ancient of Days on his throne in heaven, and he sees the angels, and it's this beautiful picture of, of, of the throne room of God. And what he sees is the anointed one who is the Son of Man that comes and is anointed to be the Messiah. Is is this Jesus talking about himself? Is he referring to that? Is he referring to something else? And and what does it mean that he's going to be delivered into the hands of these other people? What does he mean by that? For us, it seems so clear because it's hindsight. For them, it was not only looking towards the future, but notice this. They were not allowed to, to be perceptive on this. They didn't perceive it. It's the same thing we see throughout the Gospels, that even when Jesus is preaching to the people in Jerusalem, there's this dual thing happening, where on one hand, they are rejecting him, and on the other hand, God is making it so they're not understanding everything is seen. Why? Because if they understood exactly who he was, the crucifixion wouldn't happen. 
It's this weird thing in theology that we see, and we even get this tension that takes place. Um, this last week, I, I met a gentleman, uh, someone that was working on our church building, and, and I'm walking through, you know, they're doing construction stuff, and here I come walking in with Birkenstocks, shorts, and a t-shirt on, right? And so everyone's looking at me like, what are you doing? And, uh, you know, someone came up and talked to me, and I was like, oh, I'm the pastor here, just checking it out. And, and he was like, oh, he, he said, what kind of church is this? I was like, well, I mean, a Christian church, Christ the King, you know. And he said, yeah, but what type? And I said, well, what exactly are you asking? That's an open-ended question there. And he said, are you Calvinist? And as soon as he said that, I was like, oh, okay, here we go, right? Uh, <laughs> just go for a, a deep theological argument here. Um, you know, we get the, the whole Calvinism, Arminianism argument going on. It has to do with free will or the sovereignty of God, or are we making decisions or is God making decisions for us? And, and really, when you look at it, the answer is what? Yes. Yes. There, on one hand, the Jewish people rejecting Christ, and on the other hand, God isn't allowing them to understand everything. On here, Jesus a lot of times gets frustrated with his disciples because he's telling them the truth and they're not understanding, and yet at the same time, God isn't allowing them to understand everything. One of the first places we see that kind of concept in the Bible is all the way back in Exodus with Pharaoh, where every time Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, the God of our people says, let my people go, It'll either say, and Pharaoh hardened his heart towards God, or it will say, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart towards him. Both are at play at the same time. In his sovereignty, he has this worked out for his will. And it's incredible. Um, this gives me a little bit of pause. Because I look at this and I just have to flat out understand that as a preacher, teacher, when I give the word, it's not about me. I do my best to give the word with clarity. I, I try to uh, put the cookies on the lowest shelf, if you will, um, which is easy because I, I sort of just migrate to the lowest shelf myself, right? So I'm like, well, if I can understand it, everybody else will obviously get it, right? Um, I, I, I look at this and I, I try to be clear, but ultimately, if we are understanding the Word of God, it is because the Holy Spirit is the one revealing it to us. And it's an incredible gift. Um, Jesus Christ, on the night they had the Passover feast, the night he would be arrested and betrayed, said this to his disciples. John 16, starting at verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and will declare it to you. That's one of the beautiful things about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings the knowledge of truth to people. It's the Holy Spirit, uh, which means this. We need to pray for clarity, and by that, I mean we need to pray that the Holy Spirit opens people's ears and minds, opens up their hearts to be able to receive the gospel when it is shared with people, whether through preaching, teaching, uh, a personal testimony, a conversation somewhere. It's the Holy Spirit that softens and moves. It is God that calls us to him. And it's an absolutely beautiful thing. What does it look like when you are a disciple of Christ? You begin to have clarity. 
about the things of God, what is said in his word, as you actively press into it and the Holy Spirit moves and begins to reveal these things. This section goes on in verse 46, and it says this, an argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you is the one who is the greatest. This little teaching is about humility. Humility. There is no place for pride or arrogance in the church of Jesus Christ. There's no place for it. I mean, even with the previous thing we talked about, clarity. Where does the clarity come from? From the Holy Spirit. Not by us. So we should never have pride if maybe we think we have more knowledge than somebody else. The disciples are arguing about who is the greatest. And you think about this, I could see where this would bubble up somewhere. I mean, as we've read this, the transfiguration happened. It was always the 12 disciples who became the 12 apostles and Jesus but before this took place, Jesus went up on a hill, and who did he take? Peter, James, and John, right? Peter, James, and John, three out of the 12, and two of them are brothers, right? So suddenly, it almost appears like Jesus is playing favorites, okay? Now, he's not. We know that Jesus only did the types of things that the Father told him to do, so there's a reason why this is happening. You have Peter, who is the one who does end up sort of taking the lead with the apostles. You have James, who is the first martyr from among the apostles. And you have John, who is the only apostle that wasn't killed for his faith, that grew in age till a ripe old age in his 90s, and wrote John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation, Right? They all have these significant things about them. But there's this time where they are sitting there bickering, fighting about who is the greatest. I, I, I don't know if you've watched uh, the TV series, The Chosen. And as soon as I say that, some of you are like, oh, I love that one. Others of you are like, oh, is he endorsing it? Look, anytime there's a movie or a TV show that's based off of something in the Bible, it's not 100% accurate. We'll just get that out there. But I, I enjoyed the series. I love the conversations I've had about it, and I love the way they perceive uh, what's going on. But one of the things you do see over and over again that they get right is the bickering amongst the disciples. They just bicker and bicker and bicker. They're jealous of each other. It's interesting, when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we get that chapter wrong so often because we usually hear it at weddings. So we think that love chapter is about romantic love. It's not. It's not about an eros romantic love. It's about an agape love. And it's put there because it's written to a church that's fighting about all kinds of different things. And specifically, in the section it's in, you have chapter 12, which is about spiritual gifts. You have chapter 14, which is about how to use our gifts in a church service type setting. And right in the middle of it is this love chapter where, where Paul's saying like, guys, you got to love each other. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am nothing but a what? resounding gong, just a clanging cymbal, right? Which means it doesn't matter what I say if I'm not saying it with love. It doesn't matter at all. And it goes through this whole series. One of the phrases in there is, love is not jealous. Love is not jealous. And because we usually think of that passage in romantic terms, we tend to think of it more of like, oh, okay, well, I shouldn't be jealous with my spouse. That's not what it's saying. It's saying when you're in church with other people, 
Don't be jealous of what God is doing in their life. Be thankful. Praise Him for it. There's no place for that. This is not a competition. This is a team. This is a team. We are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. We are part of His kingdom. You look at this. This was a problem here and all the way up. You read about it again in John. You read about it again in John that even at the Passover supper, the disciples are bickering with each other about who's the greatest, who's the best, who's going to get the best seat of authority. And it's where John tells them that people will know us by our what? Love for one another. Our love for one another. A disciple of Christ receives clarity by the Holy Spirit Disciples have a humility about them. It's not about who is the greatest. In fact, you look at this and he's saying, look at this little child. Uh, We wouldn't think this little child is the greatest up here. They might be the cutest. They might be the feistiest, the funniest, the stinkiest. I don't know. Um, But uh, they're probably not considered the greatest. (laughs) I love this. It starts dumping uh, down rain in here and everyone's all of a sudden... I love the struggle going on with so many of you because you're like, um, should I look outside? He's looking at me. Should I look outside? He's looking at me. Uh, (laughs) All right. Everyone just look outside and get it over with. (laughs) Yeah. Wow, that's big raindrops out there. Um, You look at this, and Jesus' point is just this. Within the kingdom of God, it's the one's who are the least, the ones who serve the most, who are the greatest. Next section, John answered Jesus, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him, for one who is not against you is what? For you. you. This section is about unity. Unity. John's looking at this, and, and, and they have the 12. They've been given this power and authority to, to preach the word, power and authority to heal people, power and authority to cast out demons. They're the 12, right? That's kind of cool. They probably, you know, if they were in a church today, they would all have numbered jerseys probably with their names on it, right? They're the 12. And all of a sudden, while they're doing ministry, John hears something and looks over and he's like, well, wait a second, that guy right there, he's not one of the 12. He's not one of the 12. How dare he just step up with that authority and how dare he cast out that demon, right? Doesn't that seem petty, right? It's this total us versus them mentality. It's an us versus them. And notice it's not like Jesus... This man is casting out demons, and he is a false teacher. No, no false teaching happening. He's not saying, Jesus, this man's casting out demons, and he's not even a believer. No, it's not saying that. Jesus, this man is casting out demons, and and, uh, man, he is just like a man of poor character. He really is a sinful guy, and, and he's abusive, and no, it's simply, he's not part of our group. Unity unity. When I look at our church, we are a lot of people that have come from different church backgrounds, different church backgrounds. And one of the things I ask people all the time when I meet you, like I'll sit down for coffee, I'll be like, hey, tell me about your background. And I love to hear like some of you are like, I I didn't grow up in a church or some of you are like, I'm just a brand new believer. Some of you though are like, oh, I grew up in this denomination and this is what I was taught and this is what I believed. Or I grew up in this denomination, and this is what I was taught. This is what I believe. It it informs me a lot about our church and our backgrounds. For me, I grew up in the Restoration Movement. During the Second Great Awakening, it was a a group of people, while there were revivals taking place uh, in the country, that said, you know what? We shouldn't be like Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists. You know, uh, instead, we're all Christians. And they coined this motto to say, we're Christians only, but not the only Christians. 
And the idea was, hey, as believers and people are coming to Christ, can, can we just be Christians and can we get along? I love that. The only thing is, to be honest, it didn't take too long before that group of let's just be Christians decided to start arguing about different theological points and started adding more to it and, and, and pretty soon became, I, I used to tease my dad because it's non-denominational, I used to say, oh, we're part of the non-denominational denomination. And uh, he used to get really upset about that. And I was like, well, we, I mean, look, we have our own camps, our own Bible colleges, our own things, and, and a lot of times we only do people, do uh, ministry with people that have the same sign, you know? Um, it, it's kind of funny that way. I, I, I don't like seeing denominationalism. When people ask about our church, I just say we're non-denominational. We, with our doctrinal statements, stick to the basics. Are there things that we're dogmatic about with our doctrines? Yes. But our level of dogmatism rises and falls with the clarity in Scripture. So things in Scripture that are very clear, we're dogmatic about. Things that aren't as clear, we tend to like get a little bit more gracious with it. And here you have this where it's just like not, that guy over there, he's not one of us. Jesus, go put him in his place. And you're just like, look, he's doing my work. He's not against you. He's for you. He's not against you. He's for you. Um, when we first started our church, there, uh, it was really kind of an awkward thing because um, there was just really a lot of high school and college age people when we first started. Um, in fact, after a little while, I was like, man, I think I might be in the wrong town. Maybe I need to go to a college town or something. Because um, it was primarily high school, college age people, some of their parents that came to support, and then Ed and Pat. And Ed and Pat were in their 90s, right? And, uh, and um, they were like our, our token elderly people at church. Um, you have all these college age people, and, uh, and then Ed and Pat. And it got to the point where everybody loved Ed and Pat. Like, it was awesome. When we celebrated on a Sunday, um, there was probably about 40 of us and Ed and Pat, and we had a cake for their 65th wedding anniversary, you know? And uh, it was just, uh, it was awesome having Ed and Pat uh, at our church. Just absolutely uh, loved them to death. I love them to death. And uh, you know what? Um, earlier today, I just a quick side note, I set my coffee down. I spent the first two worship songs walking around the building trying to find my coffee only to realize it was right there on my seat. And uh, I, I just, as I started talking about Ed and Pat, it wasn't in my notes on what I was talking about. And I, I, I feel myself just welling up with emotion about Ed and Pat and uh, how much I love them and completely forgot how I was connecting that with this passage. <laughs> Oh, my mom and dad are, are homesick, and they're watching this on online right now, and they're laughing at me and rejoicing that I'm becoming like them. Um, <laughs> you get it. Let's just move on. Verse 51. Verse 51. Oh, oh I remember. Eh, it wasn't that good of a point. We'll just move on. Um, <laughs> verse 51. When the dra days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. Talked about clarity. We talked about unity. We talked about humility. And this section is about mercy. Mercy. These people in this village, they see Jesus, they hear he's coming. And rather than allowing Jesus and his disciples to go into the village and minister to them, they reject him. Why? Because he's on his way to Jerusalem. This right here 
is connected to the story with the woman at the well that we see in John. It's the story of Jesus going to a specific well that was near the foot of the mountain that Jesus is near in Samaria right here. And while he is there, the gospel goes out and all of these people start coming to Jesus Christ. And what he taught them was this. The woman's saying, the Jews are saying that we have to go to Jerusalem to worship, but we Samaritans, we worship on this hill. This is where we worship. Now what's happening? Jesus comes to the same area. They're still stuck on worshiping on this hill. And they don't like the fact that Jesus is bypassing them and going to Jerusalem to that hill instead. So they just flat out reject him. James and John, these two brothers, they well up, they're indignant about this. And I get like that. Do you ever get indignant for your savior? Yeah. So they want to be like Elijah, who in Samaria, it was called Israel at the time, but this region, called down fire on the prophets of Baal and burned up the sacrifice. They're like, hey, you're being mocked. You're being like uh, kind of pushed aside, Jesus. How dare they? You are the Messiah. Let us call down fire on them, right? Let us burn our enemies to a crisp. And it's at this time that they get the nickname, the Sons of Thunder, right? The Sons of Thunder. Jesus rebukes them because he's not there to burn up his enemies. He's there to die for their sins. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. His kindness that leads us to repentance. Now, I know I have been guilty of being like the Sons of Thunder. Uh, You know, in our small group, I I love the small group that we had this last winter and uh, spring. It was just such a good time going through Psalms. But as we studied Psalms, a lot of them we studied were King David praying against his enemies, right? And he prayed some curses on his enemies. You know, there's times when I have enemies... And I find myself praying against them like King David. Like King David. And I get within myself just this this anger, and I'm like, this isn't right, and and this shouldn't be happening. Lord, uh, you know, a pox on their house. And, uh, And then it's like I get a check from the Holy Spirit. And I have to say, Lord, am I being like the sons of thunder? Am I being like the sons of thunder? Lord, you know my heart. I'm angry about this because what's happening is wrong. But Lord, I don't know how to pray right now. Part of me wants to to pray for destruction for this person. But Lord, what what if you have something else for them? And and what if you're using these things and, and you're trying to bring this person around to your kingdom? What if this person's not Pharaoh? What if they're Saul of Tarsus? Lord, I don't know what to do with this, so help me to know how to pray. Disciples of Jesus Christ have to be marked with mercy because that's who he is. Look at how gracious and merciful he has been to us. How can we not but turn around and give grace and mercy even when we're persecuted? Marks of a disciple you notice there's been a little bit of something going on here so far uh, with these. Um, I, I have this marked out, the first section, clarity, then humility, then unity, then mercy. This last section, we're just going to call it grit. No why on the end of it. Not gritty, just grit. Um, let's finish this out. A few quick teachings he has right at the end. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, 
Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus is like, I don't have a home. You gonna come with me? You're gonna be homeless with me. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow looks back and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. For me, I summarize that section up as grit. Grit, grit is courage, resolve, strength of character. If you're called and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're a disciple. To be a true disciple is going to take grit. It's going to take grit. A, a resolve that I am going to follow him no matter what. A resolve that he is going to now take the first priority in my life. He comes first. Above everything. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what's the next part? And all these things will be given unto you. Uh, the, the family issues, the home issues, the, the resources issues, they will be taken care of by the Lord. But put him first. Let's be honest. Our tendency is to not to put him first. We worry about our income, our retirement, our insurance, our security, our, our, our family, our future, our entertainment, our comfort. We tend to put all of these things first. If you're like, do I do that? You want to know one of the quickest ways to tell? Go look at your bank account. Go look at your bank account. Where your money is, there your heart will be also. <laughs> you look at it, and it's like, look at your bank account. What do you spend most of your money on? What goes first, your first fruits? Now, I know right here, as soon as I just touch that thing of money, someone will leave our church. Every single time in all the years of me preaching, every time I touch the issue of money and ask the question, hey, are, do you give to the Lord? Also, I'm not saying tithing. I'm just talking about priorities here. It's a way to tell somebody leaves. That's exactly what the people did and what we just read. One person, their comfort and their home life is too much for them. They want to nest so they don't follow the Lord. Another person, is it wrong to want to have a funeral for your father or mother? No, not at all. But Jesus is pushing that button because he knows their father and mother take first place, not the kingdom of God. You know, the whole story with the rich young ruler and Jesus is like, go sell all of your possessions and then follow me. And it says he walks away sad Jesus isn't saying to everybody for all time, sell all your possessions. He says it to that guy because he knows that's that man's first priority. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to follow Christ and truly be his disciples, it takes grit. It takes grit. And I just want to say this. We have a gift to help us along the path with that. 2 Timothy, it's Paul's last letter at the end of his life. This is what he says, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flames the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. A spirit of power, love, and and self-control. Everything we've talked about in these five sections, we have the power to emulate Christ, to be like him, 
because we have a power, a love, and a self-control that comes from His Spirit. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, His prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Church, I, I praise God for you. I praise God that I get to pastor a church full of people that want to get to know Christ more and make him known to more people. I I praise God that we have a church full of people that uh, put up week after week with my silly illustrations, my uh, my, my goofy forgetfulness, uh, things going haywire in here, just so that we can dig into the Word and get closer to Him and become more like Him. I praise God that we're His disciples. We have a holy calling, a holy calling. I praise God for what the Spirit is doing in our lives today.